Amen. Thank you, Chipper. All right, well, it is great to be with you. Like Chipper said, and we just did an interview, my name is Chris Musgrove. Um, this is actually our 10th year in Gainesville, so this is how fast life goes by. Uh, but I remember one of our first, we moved here from overseas. We were uh, missionaries in East Asia uh, with crew, and we moved to the University of Florida. One of our first Sundays at Christ Community 10 years ago, uh, the pastor, Rob Penley, who's no longer there, but he introduced this guy, Chipper Flanagan, and said we're a part of this exciting new church plant that's going to happen downtown. And uh, that was one of my first memories at Christ Community Church. Here we are 10 years later. It happened. It was a success, I guess, here we did it. There might have been, I imagine there were people that were in that room that are probably in here, either this service or next service as well. So it's really cool for me to be a part of that. Also, I was just going to say selfishly, I have a lot of good friends here at City Church. And what a, I love our city, that we can have friends in different churches. But there's a lot of important people in my life. So thank you all for, one, supporting us, but two, just enriching the life of me and my family. You all have been great friends, and it's uh, so great to be with uh, people who I know and love so well. Uh, I know, City Church, y'all did a missions conference here last week, and so I hope this is appropriate, because what I would like to do is kind of even build on it. To me, this is a, very, a missions talk, and a mission something that's been really central in my life, uh, but connect it not just to what we do overseas, though that is, you know, incredibly important, and we, all, you know, we need more and more people to do that, but also to, to bring that back home to what does that look like for us? What does it look like for for, uh, how do we connect that to our lives and our purpose? Uh, this is a question that has been really important in my life. So um, just to give you a little background, I went to Auburn University. My life was really changed by the end of my junior year in college. I experienced some really kind of great life change uh, through crew and a Bible study in my fraternity house. And one of the first things that happened, and I think this is just God's grace, is, I mean, a month or two after my life started to change, I got invited on a trip to go overseas to East Asia. And so before I really knew what happened, I was on a plane and I was on East Asia. And I always tell people this trip, I never, to the day, I've never recovered from it. The things I saw over there, the way I saw God work, the way my imagination for what he's up to in the world and how he's using people, how big it is, how beautiful it is, I, I never recovered. And so as soon as I got back, I said, I, we, I have to do that again. That, that was really amazing. So I graduated. The first year I went overseas, after I graduated, was on a team. I didn't really know the language. I didn't know anything, but I was ready, and I was excited. One of the, f the first week I was there, I didn't have a cell phone yet, didn't speak any language. Me and my, one of my other teammates, they put us in a cab, and, you know, in the own language there, they told us where to go. They said, okay, we're sending y'all 40 minutes across town to a new campus. We've got some friends there that are going to meet y'all, and we're gonna, they're going to have like an English party for you, and you'll get to know other friends. And we thought, okay, great. Close the door, we take off, and you have this moment where you're like, but if they don't go there, or if they don't know what you said, or they're not there, what do we do exactly? Because we don't have phones in any language, and we're 40 minutes away. And oh, well, I guess it works out. And sure enough, like these things happen overseas, they're always so crazy, it works out. And our friends meet us. Uh, that first night, I met my first friend, a guy, his English name was Penny. And if there's any Orlando Magic fans that want to be dated, Penny Hardaway was who he named himself after. And so we hit it off. I said, hey, well, let's grab lunch tomorrow. So literally like the fourth day I'm in the country for the year, I grab lunch with Penny and I don't know why it's like kind of quick, but I just like, I'm going to share the gospel with this guy. I feel like he's ready. He's excited. We're talking. The very first appointment, the very first week that I'm overseas, I share the gospel, and he accepts Christ. I meet with him all year. And it's just, you know, an amazing story. So I had this amazing year. I come back. I'm on staff with crew at Auburn. We keep going back and forth. In 2006, uh, as the summer project, I met my wife. We led a summer mission trip, and um, we're in a new city. So in, down, in downtown in this city, they were outgrowing all the universities. So many new people were going to college that they were literally overflowing the university. So the, what they did is they turned all of those campuses into grad schools and said, we're going to move like 45 minutes out into farmland and build a university city. So we're going to take like 10 universities and build them in one place. So our first summer, we went to the university city, and it really wasn't built up yet. So you just had these huge roads 
and kind of farms and a few universities and have a picture. We would go hiking on the weekends and we'd go hiking through these rice paddies and you'd kind of stumble on these little farming communities and we would take Bibles with us in our backpack and we'd have conversations and most of them had never seen a foreigner. Some of them have heard of Jesus. Some of them haven't. Most of them knew very little if they knew. We'd have these great conversations. We'd leave them Bibles. We'd come back. These amazing experiences. I got married in 2007, and we always wanted to go back to East Asia, so we went for three years this time, from 2009 to 2012. One of the amazing things we got to do in, in this time, in this little stretch, uh, there are unreached people groups in this area, like over 500. Uh, so there's a lot of, of people that don't really have, have not been reached with the gospel yet. And there's not like a lot going on with them at the moment. And so we would take a couple moments each year. We'd get a team of kind of na native believers and a team of Americans. We'd go and not just to share the gospel, but before that, we'd want to like build a cultural kind of profile or folder so that more long-term missionaries could go and do it in more culturally appropriate ways, really understand the people, understand where they're coming from. But our job was to go and find these places. So remember one year, they just circled a place on the map. You know, this feels like it's 100 years ago now with Google Earth and stuff. They said that we think these people are somewhere in this circle. So what we're asking you to do is, you know, take a train, then take a rent a van. And when you get there, just start asking people if they know where these people are. And if you find them, hopefully they'll invite you to stay with them. And again, I'm like, well, what if they don't invite us to stay with them? Where do we stay? And they're like, oh, they'll invite you to stay. So I'm like, okay, this is a lot of faith. But we get on the train, we got on the van, and sure enough, we, we found this group of people. We're driving down the road, and somebody pulls up beside us to see who it is. They look in, they see there's like a foreigner. So they get excited, they roll down the windows, we start talking, and they go, you have to stay with us. So we spent three days there. It's the coldest I've ever been. Uh, I was kind of up in the mountains. Uh, they didn't have running water. Uh, they had electricity. It's funny, yeah, the stuff they have and don't have. They didn't have electricity. I mean, they had electricity. They didn't have running water. Um, but it, we had this amazing three-day experience learning about this people group, building this cultural profile, and coming back. Now, I just highlight a couple of stories real, real briefly. But w one of the things that always happens, a 10-year period from 2001 really to 2012 that I was back and forth in this area. My life was greatly shaped. And uh, every time I was there, you know, one thing that always w was true was my life felt so alive. I just felt, it felt significant what we were doing. Every time you got on a bus and you were the only Westerner, it just felt significant. The problem is, every time we'd lead teams over, or I'd be on a team, we'd go, we'd bring people back, we'd always have the same conversation, right? How do we do this back in the States? We had the most amazing week, summer, year, couple years. How do we keep this going? How do we live significantly when we're not overseas on one of these trips? And to be honest, I, I was never sure what to tell them. We'd say things, right? We'll do this in the States. We'll keep it going. But you know this malaise always returns to life. John Mark Comer says it this way in The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. I believe he starts the book saying this. I feel like a ghost. Half alive, half dead, more numb than anything else. Flat, one-dimensional, but mostly I feel blah spiritually. So I think this is what happens. You can have these really amazing spiritual high moments where life feels important and significant. You can transition back, and somewhere along the way, life kind of beats us down into a little bit of malaise or a little bit of numbness. And I think this is the fracture, the kind of crack where dualism can sneak in. Dualism would say that, you know, the spiritual things, those are the real things. Those are the important things. It's the kind of the physical, secular e elements of life that keep us down, that aren't quite good. You need to figure out how to get more of this in your life and less of this. Right? And, and this is a problem that will suddenly pull us into that kind of numb malaise type of pattern when you start doing that and you keep playing that out like overseas and and sunday mornings and whatever uh service those are the good things that's what we're waiting for work can slowly and subtly and sneakily become actually an obstacle to god's work 
Now it's something we have to kind of, you know, get through so we can get to God's mission later on the weekend, after work, take a week off and go on a mission trip. Or maybe it's not an obstacle, maybe it's a platform, right? So it's, I would say, work can become a so that endeavor. I work so that I can support people that do the mission. I work so that maybe I'll have a good standing in the community and I'll be respected and then I'll, my words will carry more. Or I'll, people that I work with, I'll make uh, influence on, which that's great to do. But sometimes we never make it to the most important part that our, our work is not just an obstacle, it's not just a platform, but it's actually an essential part of the mission of God. And when we start to see that, all of a sudden things can change in our day-to-day life. All right, so here's my, my main idea for what I'd like to do this morning, of uh, both through the scripture and just kind of in general. Here's what I, I think I found that our imagination for what God is up to in the world is far too small. It's far too narrow. And because our imaginations for what God is doing in the world is too small and narrow, our enjoyment of the world is too small, and our participation in the world is too weak. Right? So if we can expand our imagination, see, every, see all these places that God's at work, it would call us into join him building and bringing his kingdom. So that's our hope this morning, is that we would have our imagination expanded and that maybe we'd be called more vibrantly into God's uh, kingdom. Now, in a fellows program, we, we spend nine months doing something like this. We'll see where we get in 15 or 20 minutes. Let me read the scripture, and uh, we'll pray and then get into it. This is Colossians 1, 15 through 20. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Uh, Lord Jesus, we praise you for your word. Would you be our teacher? We don't um, need my words. We need your words this morning. Lord, we need your truth. Lord, would you wake us up? Holy Spirit, would you be rich among us? Knit us together as friends and church family. Uh, do a great work with us this morning and uh, teach us your word in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, first point this morning is that Jesus creates and sustains everything. It may seem basic, but so often we change this reading in our minds. Not that he creates all things and in him all things hold together, that he's before all things and he reconciles all things. But somewhere along the way, when that division, that kind of fracture happens, all the spiritual things, right? All the things on Sunday, all the things when my Bible's open and I'm praying, and we lose so much. But actually, in the beginning, as Jesus creates, he speaks, it is good, over creation six times. Each day he creates, he says, it is good. 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 In the sustaining his creation, that all things hold together, one commentator said that it is good that is spoken over creation in Genesis is echoed over it continually over and over again as it is sustained. So everything that exists right now, I love this is great imagination for this, everything that exists right now, including you, you're being held together by Jesus saying it is good, it is still good. You are still good. There is a plan here. Stay with us. It holds together. And so everywhere we go now is this sacred space where Jesus is intentionally keeping it together. Your friendships that are barely hanging on, the relationships you wonder about. Everywhere you go, our world is fracturing, right? But Jesus, it is good. It is good. There is hope. We need this imagination. Um, I think so much of this starts with attention. 
you know there's a huge battle for our attention and where our eyes go. Poet Mary Oliver has a famous line. She says, attention is the beginning of worship. Uh, each uh, December, right at the beginning of Advent, we do a little fellows overnight just to kind of get in the Advent spirit. It's a silent retreat. By silent, we spend about three hours not saying anything. Uh, I feel like I do that every day at some point during the day. Some people, that's really, really hard to go three hours without talking to people. Uh, but we go outside at Lake Swan. It's cold. It's, you know, on these beautiful nights, build a fire, spread out, and spend time contemplating the incarnation, Jesus coming into the world. We did this uh, past class, we did it, and one of our fellows came up afterwards, and she was really excited. And she said, Chris, I saw my first shooting star ever tonight. And I thought, wow, that's really awesome. And as I thought more about that, I thought, I wonder how many, I thought, you know, each generation, I bet, sees less and less shooting stars. You know, and it's not that there's less of them in the world, right? It's just, do we ever spend time looking up anymore? We stay inside or we're outside with our phone looking down. So it's not that there's less of them. It's just where is our attention going? And will, each, will there be a generation one day that just never sees a shooting star because there's too many other things to look at? There's an experiment they did in Washington, D.C. a few years ago. The Washington Post wrote about it. I think they set it up. There's a famous vi uh, violin classical musician, Joshua Bell. Again, maybe you know him, maybe you don't. This is downtown, very cultured church, I know. You might know of people like this. Um, but he's recognized as one of the top classical musicians in the world. They gave him a violin that was $3.5 million. It was like 17th century French in this certain province when somehow they just made perfect violins. The wood, the resin, it was perfect. So it's one of the most expensive violins in the world, one of the best musicians. He was playing what he considers the best piece of music ev ever created. All right, so they're going to do all this. They were going to put it in a Washington, D.C. subway. They wanted to do this. They here's what they wanted to know. Would beauty transcend a busy rush hour morning? Right? So if you took the best violinist with the best violin playing the best music, would it cut right through all the drudgery of a Tuesday morning rush hour? Later that night, he was playing a concert. If you wanted to watch him, you'd have to pay upwards of $1,000 for a ticket to hear him play. They set up. He played for 45 minutes. Over 1,000 people walked by. Here's the question. How many people stopped to listen? Seven. Over 1,000 and seven stopped. So here, here's the question. If there was beauty or glory or grandeur beside you, above you, around you, are you sure you would notice? Man, so much of our lives are programmed to say, you know where beauty and grandeur live? They live in Paris and New York. It's out west in the mountains. Man, I just want to say, I know Gainesville can seem to be a sleepy place. It's a beautiful place. And if you think that the beauty and glory and grandeur are out there, if you're the kind of person that can't see it here, I, I do worry you'll be the kind of person that won't find it there either. I mean, God is in all these spaces. We have to wake our imaginations up. Uh, there's a, I'll do this. So every now and then, there's a fa uh, family on Instagram, the Bucket List family, if you know them. There's a lot of these types of people. They're travel bloggers, right? This is a way to make a living these days. You get to do all the cool things and take pictures of it, and people somehow fund this by following you and doing this. It seems unfair. Maybe I'm jealous. Uh, but there, to me, I'm like, this is the most unchristian imagination. Travel's great, by the way. Please travel, enjoy the world. The world's awesome. Uh, but this idea that we extract things from the world, Right? That go to these 10 places and extract these experiences. That is not a Christian imagination. Right? The Christian imagination is we stay here, and we, not that you have to stay here, but wherever you are, wherever God calls you, you build things that are beautiful and meaningful and holy, and you invite your neighbors into it. Right? We, we extend that. We don't extract it from other places. Right? And so we, this is one of the things we're called to do 
here in Gainesville. Steve Garber writes a lot about faith and work. I love this quote, right? It's just making really normal, easy things sacred. He says, we live, work, and play in a God-bathed world. All the goodness in life that we enjoy is a gracious gift from God. The food we eat, the music we enjoy, the chirping of songbirds we delight in, the afternoon rain shower that soothes a thirsty and parched earth, the sweet smile of a baby, the tender embrace of a mother, the passion of a kiss, the smell of breaking bread and meat grilling, the glories of the sea and the sky, the gift of good work that satisfies and serves, the ordered safety of street lights and speed limits, although some people would press back on speed limits, the wonders of a good novel and good music, the miracles of x-ray and dental care, the bright yellow daffodils and the pastels of fox foxgloves, the steady support of friends, the enduring affection of a spouse. Each of these are beautiful graces. You know, I often think I'm kind of nostalgic by nature. Like if I'm 90 and I'm on my deathbed and before I go, Jesus is like, why don't you go back to when you're in your 40s and your kids are at home. Take one more Saturday with them. Can you imagine the difference you might live that? And you know, what, whatever our version of that time is, or pick any time in my life, you know, that just happens to be the season I'm in now. How different would your eyes be? How different would your imagination be for that season? That there's beauty all around us. So here's the main point of this first one. We need to expand our imagination for what God's up to in the world, right? That he plays in 10,000 places. And we do that with the hopes that a increased imagination invites an increased participation. That there is nothing in this world that is beyond the hope of redemption. Verse 19, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. I mean, the, the, the cross, yes. This is where we are individually redeemed, where we repent and believe in Christ and are brought into his kingdom. All right, it's a beautiful reality, right? It changed my life forever. It's a, it's a great place. It doesn't end there. All things are reconciled in Christ. There's often this misconception, or there has been in some parts of the Christian world, that the world is merely a stage or a prop. It's like a backdrop for the play of spiritual redemption. Dutch theologian Abraham Kuyper says, There is not one square inch in the whole domain of our human exis existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. He is a cosmic king and ruler. He wants to make all things new. The question is, how does he do this? How does he go about renewal, the renewal of all things? Jesus, right now, in heaven, is ruling and reigning. Right? He is the king. He is creating and sustaining and calling things the way it is. But in this amazing play, he invites us to join him. Right? He invites and calls our participation in it. He uses his image bearers. He does that by gifting and gearing each of us to serve in a different part of the vineyard, to work in a different part of the garden. I always say, imagine there's four doors. You think about what you do for a living, and there's four jobs you can have. Behind the first door is a kindergarten classroom. Behind the second door is an emergency room. Behind the third door is like this off, kind of a cubicle, and it's got three monitors with a bunch of Excel sheets. And the fourth door goes to a family farm. Which door do you walk through? If you had to work in one of those places, where would you go? Where, what would your nightmare be? Would you be like anyone but this one? Right? Isn't it amazing? God gears us and gifts us to serve in a number of these areas. Some people would love the one that the person next to you would hate. This is God's good gift of grace that we can serve and love our church family and also our community in these ways. I wanted to end just by talking about a couple stories of how this has played out in my life. I've got a couple of pictures here. Uh, the first is, is of my sixth grade football team. 
I'm from Nashville, went to Christ the King Catholic School up in Nashville. It's a very important group of people in my life. That's me on the front row with a broken arm. It's just going to be a theme of me in football. Um, the guy in the red hat, that's my old coach, Coach Cat Nanny. We called him Coach Cat. He told us a story one day. Um, he said before practice, he said, y'all know y'all are, y'all are Belmont boys? We're like, well, no, Coach, what's that? Uh, Belmont Boulevard, by the way, is the road that runs in front of our school out there. You see it in the background. He goes, well, people all over Nashville know the Belmont boys. They're scared of y'all because y'all are so tough. Y'all hit so hard. Y'all have got such a reputation around Nashville that nobody wants to play y'all. And we thought, wow, that's really impressive. We're the Belmont boys. To the day, I don't know if that was ever a thing at any point. But the more you go back and you think, you know, this is what a coach tells a fifth and sixth grade football team that's probably a little soft. <laughs> and he needs them to believe you are actually need to be tougher if we have any chance this weekend, right? Uh, but as it turns out, middle school and high school are actually a lot tougher than they should be, right? And there's a number of times I was going to need to believe I was tougher than I really was. How many times, how many coaches, how many teachers spoke words of life like this into my life? Right, built me up over years. Coach Cat, coach football, volunteered for 34 years, never got paid a dime. He, he did insurance. He did this after school. He died in 2016. In his obituary, he said his greatest joy was his kids. He truly loved his players, seeing them compete and mature into young men, women, while following them through their high school and college careers. All right, there, there's people like this that do great work in our lives. Number 32, he's in the middle, two places under Coach Cat, who's in the red hat. That's my best friend growing up, Mike Dunn. Uh, we went to daycare together, went to grade school together, went to high school together. We split up for college. He went to MTSU in Nashville. I went to Auburn. Uh, we graduated the same year. He became a financial planner. He set me down the summer I graduated. He said, you got to start planning for your retirement. And I said, cool, okay, I love that. I'm going to be a missionary for a year, so next year when I start my real job, let's talk and we'll figure all the financial stuff out. And he said, no, that's not good enough. You need to start right now. And if you know, I, you know, I grew up with him. He's hard-headed. He's stubborn. He wins. He loves arguing. I'm kind of a people pleaser and a pushover. It's like, okay, fine, I know where this is going. What do I need to do? Sign up. He kind of bullied me into it. Uh, I s signed up 19 years later, 228 paychecks later, every one of my paychecks, I have sent something to retirement because of my, my best friend, Mike Dunn. We meet every couple years and we'll look over how we're doing. And I'm always like, man, thank you for doing that. When I graduated, that was so, look at this. We have like a retirement. And he always goes, that's not near enough. And you're actually not doing that great. And um, I'm like, no, it feels like a lot. I would have nothing if you didn't do that. Who knows what I would, you know, this was amazing. You did an amazing job. I can't believe this is here. And he goes, not good. You're doing the same amount when you're a single missionary. And I'm like, well, actually, I got three kids now. It's um, even more amazing. I can do it at this stage in my life. And it was easy then. Now it's hard, right? But that is great work. The next picture, this is my... Um, Doctor, so my senior year in football, my last game, or my second to last game, my senior year, of course, I get tackled and hear my knee pop, limp off the field. Uh, Dr. Allen Anderson meets me on the sidelines, and he does some, moves my knee around, he goes, son, uh, what year are you? I said, well, I'm a senior. He said, okay, well, your season's over, but we'll get your knee fixed up. Three surgeries later, he was right. He fixed my knee up. Our, uh, his son, his middle son, David Anderson, ended up being a fraternity brother of mine at Auburn, who I wouldn't know, but a couple years later, I moved to Auburn. Uh, and so I'd go see him through my 20s and 30s and check up on it, and he kept me in good shape. Every time I run now, oh, he passed away, unfortunately, 2017. Dr. Anderson passed away. He was a really renowned sports uh, orthopedic surgeon in Nashville. Every time I run now, every time I, yesterday I was throwing the baseball with my kids. Every time I do something like that, I, I think about Dr. Anderson and how he returned my knee to health. He's passed away, but literally, if you were to open my knee up, you would see his good work still lives in my body. Right? It's really amazing. The last picture, this was the guy that intersected my life in Auburn. 
Bill Bolt. He's the director of crew at Auburn. You know, at the time, I would live in a place nobody wanted to come to, especially not anybody that was a Christian. And nobody wanted to come, but he was willing to come and do a Bible study. I started dropping in on that Bible study. He started asking me to lunch. We started talking life and football and all this stuff. Man, my, my life changed. All right, he took me, he took me overseas. He's been a mentor for a long time. He's a lot of ways changed the trajectory of my life. My little brother went to Auburn. He got involved. I had a cousin, uh, Anna Maltini. She went to Auburn, got involved. This is at her wedding, all right? The way he intersected my life and the way that expanded through my family, it's great work. Okay, these are kind of four random stories, right? N none of them by themselves were that extraordinary. There's probably hundreds, if not thousands, of these types of stories we could tell. But each of these intersected my life when I at a different age. They got paid different. Some of them got paid. Dr. Anderson got paid well, three knee surgeries. You know, Coach Catanani never got paid a dime for what he did. Some of them helped me physically. Some of them helped me financially. Some of them helped me spiritually. Some of them helped me emotionally. But you put them all together, and my life is this holy fabric of the good works of my friends and neighbors. This is the way God has used the people around me to build into my life. That is what he's doing in rooms like this today. The last picture, our city, Gainesville. Just like my life is a holy fabric, our city is a holy fabric of the good works of our friends and neighbors, both at City Church and our larger parish of churches in Gainesville and even our uh, friends that work in and outside the church. Right? So this is our imagination that God would expand where he is at work and that it would call us to respond in all sorts of ways wherever he has called you, wherever he has planted you. Let's pray. Lord God, we praise you for your goodness. Lord, we praise you for our stories. Would we steward those well, the ways that um, we have gifts, passions, desires, hopes, dreams, Lord, that we trust you are uh, finishing us all into the perfect work of Christ. Uh, but, Lord, we're doing that in different ways. So would City Church be a place that loves its neighbors well, uh, both through the work here locally in the church and also that expands out tomorrow on Monday and Tuesday all through, Lord. This is good work that you would teach us how to live well in your kingdom. In Christ's name, amen.